can press the analytic data with your hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they gon' tell you if your team, if they wanna love, love, and who the ball, who the ball. So listen to Professor, uh, yes sir, yes, and pay attention, boy. cause he gon' teach a lesson. Yes, and you gon' learn the day, you gon' learn the day, how your team they play, play, they play, yeah. how they play, boy, you gon' learn the day, how your team they play, they play, they play, how they play, play, yeah. We represent that swag, that me and let me say, say, what's up the Tennessee State, State? You tune into the agency and sports lab, with Dr. Bill, 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 Mike and Charles, Charles, and I'm from Town, this is Dr. Gaville with Inside the HBC Sports Lab with Mike Washington and Charles Bishop, presented by THG Agency. Welcome and thanks for joining us inside our studio lecture hall, the HBC Sports Lab for the only weekly sports talk radio show that is dedicated to exploring the sporting HBCU diaspora, including the marching sport with its unique HBCU culture identity, the teams, the bands, coaches, athletic directors, commissioners, provosts, presidents, Big rivalry matchup, classic games, homecoming, and much, much more of the HBCU athletic aesthetic. As we emerge our lecture with sports business practices and competitive sports industry, this show seeks to provide innovative, progressive, and informative dialogue about the week's HBCU sporting events, issues, and ideas from a fan's perspective. We review the Southwestern Athletic Conference, better known as the SWAC, the Mid-Eastern Athletic Conference, better known as the MEAC of the NCAA Division I, Southern Intercollegiate Athletic Conference, SIAC, Central Intercollegiate Athletic Association, the CIAA of the NCAA Division II, Gulf Coast Athletic Conference of the GCAC of the NAIA, and independent programs such as Tennessee State of the OVC, Hampton of the Big South, Langston of the Sooner Athletic Conference, and Texas College affiliate member, as well as Edward Waters, as they transition from NAIA to NCAA Division II and membership in the SIAC. I am Dr. Kenyatta Cavill, a.k.a. the Dean of the College of Sports. And again, we have with you Mike Washington and Charles Bishop. Obviously, I always like to say in terms of the Dean of H College of HBCU Sports, that was given to me by Rob Calloway. He is host of the HBCU Sports Report. You can catch him every Tuesday and as well as Thursday and Saturday. We have something in the working with Rob Calloway, so we'll bring that out in due time. Look for that to happen in a couple of weeks as we continue to build this platform. Uh, we want to welcome you for joining us and just want to say, hope you're staying safe in this COVID-19 pandemic. I know they're opening things up, uh, but be mindful. There's still some concerns out there with testing. So as much as possible, certainly keep yourself safe when you can keep your family safe in regards to your thoughts and the decisions you're making. With that, let's get yeah. to these HBCU sports news of the day. We told you that we're going to do it a little differently today. We want fan interaction, so we have you uh, on the Facebook Live page. You can check us out. Those uh, We'll be checking out, trying to check on Twitter for those following us there, uh, as well as Spreaker. So get those comments going, particularly on Facebook Live. We'll be able to make sure we keep you up. As we get into the discussion, we want your opinions and make sure that we answer some of your questions that you may have. Um, so I got these colleagues in here ready to bring it to you. But before we do that, we certainly want to get to the HBCU news of the day. Let's start with Charles first as I see you uh, sneaking on a little bit with that shirt for Cornell. And I guess we can say for those that know, they should know. I like that look. For those that don't, that's not your fault. Uh, he's bringing it. <laughs> and then I see exactly. that you a testament and you staged a little more there. I see you have the JSU old school block leather helmet in the background. I think that is a nice yeah. piece that you put up there. Then streaming on the television, I see that you have the game there in Jackson State doing this thing. Uh, and so uh, I'm not going to talk too much about that. Uh, but you know, <laughs> can see that. Uh, before I come back to you, Charles, and open us up with this HBCU news of the day, let me make sure I give a formal welcome to our co-hosts here, try hosts as we like to say it, because we all hosting this. I just try to drive it a little bit. But we got uh -huh. Mike Washington, and we see in his background he has the Prairie View flag. Uh, something about Mike Washington and these paddles. I just, you know, it gives me a little <laughs> uh, uh, But I know that 
Alpha old Phi Alpha yeah. Yeah, is no longer a hazing organization, but he is old school. <laughs> Proper do, I will give you a little bow down as you were the hey, last man, yeah. group of individuals, your brothers of two black, 12 strong. Uh, they literally right. were able to right. legally mm-hmm. walk the campus at Prairie View A&M University before you started seeing the transition from the pan uh, That was necessary in my opinion, but kudos for you being uh, one of the last group of individuals that literally got to walk uh, the campus without uh, having too much uh, problems with what that means from a hazing perspective. But we won't go there. With that, let's head. Yes, yeah, sir, you deserve it. Go back to Charles uh, uh, as he's doing it the most. But what are some yeah. HBCU news today? Yeah, let's start off with uh, the big news of the day, and this uh, comes to us from Alcorn, and this comes to us uh, from HBCUsports.com, uh, Ken Rashad's uh, website. Nate Kilbert, he was named the head women's basketball coach today yeah. at Alcorn as he comes back to Alcorn as he served as an assistant there from 1991 to 2001. During that span, the Lady Braves, they won nine titles, including six regular season championships and three SWAT tournaments. So he's getting an opportunity to come back and coach at Alcorn. Of course, his last stint was at the University of Arkansas Pine Bluff, but now he moves on to Arkin, uh, to Alcorn State University. Hey, man. Yep. Two, st- two stints. Man, he's coached at three teams now in the SWAT. Yeah. He's making the rounds. Um He's making a round. It's a great yeah. opportunity for him. Uh, interesting as he actually did make it through last season, but gets another chance in Alcorn. So it's, it'll be interesting to find a way to get a little more deep dive in terms of that. Obviously, last week we had the coach on uh, from the new coach, I should say, at Alcorn State, uh, giving him his kudos. Thought it was a tremendous hire. But I'm intrigued about this hire. Uh, with that, before I get into some more news from you, Mike, did you want any comments you want to talk about that? New hire there that yeah, just yeah. I, I found it intriguing his 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 pedigree. He's had a couple of uh, a stints at Alcorn State, if I read correctly, um, and he's been successful. So you kind of wonder why you know is, is he coming is coming back? Was there something driving his decision to return this time? Um, yeah, uh, you know, with a certain sudden departure of the previous coach. So I look forward to see big things from the from the Braves there. Good job there. Hey, Mike, um, go ahead and what are your HBCU news of the day? Oh, and uh, uh, well, I guess in honor of my sons who pay lacrosse, one of the uh, big lacrosse news, the uh, Hampton Pirates picked up a commitment in their 2020 recruitment class as of Saturday night. Uh, midfielder Eris Brown signed with the Hampton Pirates. Um, Brown is the son of uh, pro football and national uh Lacrosse Hall of Famer uh, Jim Brown, yes, pro football and National Lacrosse Hall of Famer. So the six foot four, hundred and eighty pound midfielder, which is a big dude by lacrosse standards, but means he runs both fields because he prefers to play both ends of the field. Mm. Um, com- committed and said he liked the campus, but more importantly, he wanted to play at a university or play in a system with kids who look like him. And mm. I can really, and I have a personal testimony to that because my youngest son is signed up for their uh, prospect or will be signed up for their prospect day here in late July if things don't ch- uh, you know barring any changes nice. with COVID-19 so uh, so really big pickup tremendous pickup for Hampton which started the season unfortunately 0 and 5 0 and 6 but if you follow them this is their fifth or sixth year and this is the toughest schedule they decided to play last year was their first year where they've had a winning season. They decided they decided to play a tougher schedule for a newer program. So you see big things coming from this Hampton program in the years to come. Certainly, great uh, information there. I saw that and got excited about that. I wondered if you was going to pick that up, and surely you did. And I like the way you do the tie uh, <laughs> in regards to uh, your sons uh, playing mm-hmm. lacrosse and one of them having an interest so man you talk about full circle that would be interesting that works out in a couple of years with that Charles, oh yeah <laughs> i hear you uh and you know i'll be up there checking that out if that's the case All right probably mm-hmm. get charles uh with that of course with that charles um what's some additional news you got for us 
Well, this was uh, breaking news just this afternoon. Uh, Northwestern oh, wow. State and Gram Gramlin State, they're set to renew their rivalry in Shreveport in football in 2022. Nice. So this is uh, a, a local rivalry. Both teams are separated by 73 miles, and they last played in uh, 2018. They split uh, a pair of games. Uh, Gram Got a little freeze in there. If you jump back in there, yeah. what you got, Mike? What's your next news of the day as we get – Charles back going. Yeah, uh, well, we wanted to get Charles. I hope he didn't. Uh, oh, I hope he didn't go. lose him uh, completely. Um, one of the things DC that I didn't get is Happy uh, Cinco de Mayo Day. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I should have known you would have found a way to put that in there. How are you tying this in, Charles? Mike, and we'll be right back with you to finish that up, Charles. Only uh, you, you know me. Uh, good margarita. Hey, you got you find out it. You find an occasion to have a good margarita anytime, <laughs> but only, only, only in 2020 yes. can we have Cinco de Mayo fall on Taco Tuesday right in the middle of a, the pandemic that's named after Mexican beer. Only in 2020. <laughs> <laughs> now that's the way you do it right there. My, Charles, as you were finishing up, you were telling us about a rematch uh, killing between Grambling and Northwestern State. Fall, finish that up if you would, they thought. Yeah, you got a, a FCS matchup with Grambling North Russell State. Both teams are separated by 73 miles. I'm sure this game will garner quite a bit of interest up there in the North Louisiana area. Uh, I'm sure Chuck Hunt will be very interested in this uh, renewing of the rivalry. No, no doubt will. about it. Uh, but uh, you got uh, Grambling. They lead all-time series of Northwestern State, three games to two. Uh, they split home-and-home -home series in 2017 and 2018 with Grambling beating Northwestern State 23-10 in 2017. And then uh, Northwestern State were 7 in 2018. So local flavor. Good job with that. Uh, let me stick with you, Charles, since Mike uh, gave us that uh, update there. And you were finishing up. Let's go back to you, Charles. Go ahead. Any other news that you wanted to share for HBCU News this week? Well, I thought it was very interesting. And it comes to us from uh, HBCU Game Day. But uh, a Florida Memorial, uh, they're going to be adding a women's flag football program. So yes. I'm sure we're going to get into this a little bit more. But you're starting to see some of these programs really kind of think outside the box. Kudos to women's flag football. <laughs> yeah, flag football. And then I heard, while we're talking about new sports, I heard St. Augustine talking about what they're going to do with cycling. bikes, cycling. Yes, so cycling. let's throw that yeah. in there. So um, HBCUs are finding a way to market their athletic programs to different types of students. We talked about that. I'm interested in that they're going that broad a stroke, uh, but you, just, you don't see the men's soccer. Uh, in regards to what that would do maybe from uh, middle class African Americans playing. Obviously, it would be interesting. We'll get, see that for international students, welcome them in for soccer, in addition to uh, potentially um, uh, also looking at rugby. Uh, as, as That's been a club sport. We see it big time at Prairie before club sport and some other places. Wondering will that get a chance to transition in. Uh, but, Mike, what are your next updates in, uh, in terms of the news that you have? Well, this comes to us also from HBCU Game Day. The, we got a new hiring. Lincoln University Director of Athletics Harry Stenson announced the hiring of Coach uh, Corey Lowry as the Lions' 22nd head men's basketball coach uh, following a nationwide search. Uh, so Lowry evidently comes with tremendous pretty, uh, pedigree. He brings over 20 years of experience to Lincoln, uh, including 10 years as a head coach on the junior college uh, level. Uh, and I think his overall record was 245 and 33, which is tremendous at Essex County College and Middlesex County College. So in those two seasons, Lowry won nine conference championships, eight region championship appearances, winning six times and won six district championships. He led Essex to the NC, uh, National Junior College uh, Athletic Association National Sweet 16 five time advancing to the Elite Eight National Championship game in 2014. So tremendous pedigree for uh, Mr. Lowry as he joins Lincoln University's coaching staff. Yeah, that's uh, intriguing information you got there. <clears throat> Just bringing it up. Uh, let's get it in and we get into these articles um, as we're trying to do some additional information here. 
Um, Charles, you have any other additional information you want to share before we get into some of these updates we're going to talk about? Well, I, I don't know if anybody has seen it yet, and I saw uh, HBC. I and do. They, did. Yeah. they put it on their website, but uh, Ken Griffey's son. Ken yes. Griffey. <laughs> did you see the flip? Did you that see the flip? That was some ridiculous athleticism that he showed, like a, a standing one foot uh, somersault. Yeah. You he know, a, like a, a full, a, a front was flipped. I'm like, wow. Yeah. yeah, and he does he does a push up first with one both hands and push up prone position, and then he did, does a flip like that. I I did I did two of those last week. I mean, just. <laughs> <laughs> of, of course, Tevin, he's headed down to FAMU, <laughs> so uh, tremendous athleticism yeah. for uh, Tevin Griffey. Oh, that's pretty cool. Uh, bringing it like that. Getting it down and taking his talents there to uh, Tallahassee. Those are some intriguing thoughts that's going on there in terms of what's going on. Um, Mike, did you have any other uh, news that you wanted to get out of there? Before to do that, let me get a shout out uh, to uh, Chuck Hunt checking in from Monroe, Louisiana. Brandon Bailey, crucial uh, respect. I saw that Nate Gilbert hired at all corners women basketball as you brought that news up. He was checking that out. Jimmy says, just here for the class. <laughs> that's an inside little joke uh, there, but uh, that's what we do in the lab. Uh, press recycle. I remember when Kilbert coached at Mi Mississippi Valley and UAB. Uh, that's in terms of the coaching. You can tell they're getting into that. Uh, Chuck getting excited. Talking about 2017, 2018 for the Grambling Northwestern State. Uh, Sarah Bradley says, hello, HBC Sports and in Bulldog for life. Yeah, I love those Bulldogs. How are they going to pay for all the, these revenue sports, uh, guarding Chuck Hunt and watching uh, with us in terms of what's going on there? So uh, Chris Gardner is checking us out uh, as we continue to work out some glitches there. Uh, with that, uh, as we shout out, Mike, any uh, additional things that you wanted to talk about a little bit in terms of what's going on in that market? No, Doc, I'm ready to get into the articles. I'm still on the flip. I keep going back and over, you know, and you know, I'm not too old, but I, I think I did a couple of those last week, so I, I'm, I, I still consider myself pretty athletic. <laughs> oh, my God. Of course. <laughs> so, Mike, you going in here and doing the, the flip uh, and things of that nature. Now, that's just – that's that's amazing. I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. That is just quite amazing. You better know, bro. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Call it what you will. Uh, yeah. With that, so. um, as we promised, we said we're going to look into uh, these articles here, um, breaking them down. We're going to start with the one. on or uh, that we were going to talk about was this article from the I think the Detroit Free Press yeah and uh, it's the title of the article is if colleges cut sports programs could new So uh, we're back, back on it. Try to uh, kind of wrap our minds around what this is going to look like. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know if there's a footprint uh, for what's happening now. 
I think you see programs starting to dabble and make suggestions and proposals, but there's just no footprint for what we have now. Um, we're, we're, I think we all are in uncharted uh, waters, and I, I just don't think there's a footprint that we can say, well, hey, they did it this way, they did it this way. We know that in the economic crisis in 2008, you know, programs were cut, but in terms of this, this is totally different. Uh, even if we come out of this, you know, you know, where exposures are down to a minimal and we're back to somewhat of a normalcy, uh, athletic programs are going to look, you know, different, uh, you know, from that point going forward. And they're going to maintain new practices that they haven't had to maintain before. So I think it's a new look. I just don't think we can look at our crystal ball and say, this is what the new program is going to look. I don't think there's an existing model out there to say, hey, they, it worked this way in the past. Let's do it this way. Definitively not an existing model. Uh, model. One of the things that I picked up on from the article, and this is uh, coming from former uh, Big 12 Commissioner Don Beebe, uh, Dan Beebe, I should say, and he came up with sort of what I thought was a, a really interesting idea in terms of college athletics being broken down into spectator sports or being those sports that make oh, money yeah. and participation sports, the, the sports that we don't uh, kind of consider money-making sports. And I thought it was a kind of a, a very interesting look at what our, you know, what – college athletics can look like from uh, going forward, but kind of what, what are your thoughts in terms of uh, separating out the, the money sports from, quote-unquote, the non-money sports? Yeah, and I read that, and, I, and there were actually a number of athletic directors who supported, you know, that frame of thought. Um, the, the question is, if you, sell, you, you separate the non-revenue sports from the revenue sports, you know what? You know what does that look like in terms of scholarship balance? Do you still offer scholarships um, to both to to either or? You know what does that look like in terms of still complying with either what what the current NCAA uh, Division One status is versus what the next uh, one will? So I think it's it's a good separation. I think it's kind of out of the box, but I think in the framework of our regulatory. I mean, how do you manage the, the regulatory world of NCAA Division One or even Division Two if you go down that road of separating revenue from that? I think it also pushes kind of a, a, a distance between kind of the amateur sports and or the relationship between amateur sports and collegiate athletics in, in, in a certain extent. Uh, nope. in, the, in, the, in, the, in a certain extent, you really can complete, you really create three worlds. You have amateur sports, and then you have non-revenue uh, college athletics and revenue college athletics. How do they coexist with each other? I want to jump in there and follow up some in regards to um, that process as we're looking at this particular article along uh, with the changing nature of what's going on. And these college sports programs and could take new athletic department models, you name one of the models, um, kind of wanted to go – back in terms of from a big program perspective when you look at athletic director Joe Castillo that used to be at athletic di uh, director at Oklahoma uh, in regards to him saying uh, to say it's not going to have any economic impact that I would say would be uh, grossly naive thinking about this is not going to change the framework of athletics and you gave example for him he was saying that he has a program 148 million in operating revenue now, as we talk about, that's surely different uh, what you see at the um, next five and then obviously at the FCS level, which includes HBCU programs, and then you dip down to the Division II level. It also includes HBCU programs. And then we hop over to the other association with the NIA programs where we have a group of HBCU playing within that. But furthermore, uh, then you have this whole entirely new perspective when you look at somebody like uh, the former U.S. Education Secretary uh, Arnie Duncan, who talked about the budget reflects our values. And what does it mean yep. when we talk about values? How does athletics uh, in this big spin saying that we need sports, uh, but do we need sports outpacing what do we do with our regular students when you're talking about from a college perspective? And certainly more broadly when we're talking about uh, fans, whether they're alumni or 
fans from the local area or fans following their children that are participating in these college programs at these institutions. Uh, what are your thoughts, uh, Charles, when you have that framing, when you're talking about the value associated with these budgets and how much you spend uh, uh, with these budgets versus the Power Five all the way down to HBCU programs at the FCS, again, Division Two, as well as um, the other association at the NIA level? You know, I think it's a very true statement in terms of the budgets reflect our values. Uh, to be very honest with you, um, I've, I've been kind of taken aback, uh, a little bit shocked at what I see even right now in terms of uh, uh, from youth league moving forward to high school in terms of uh, uh, coaches. They're still trained, you know, social distancing, uh, not being kind of part of the equation. Uh, you go around to various parks here in and around the area, and you still will see teams preparing uh, for football season. Uh, you will see, uh, uh, especially here in the Texas area, I mean, I have witnessed, and it's, it's been mind-boggling in terms of watching uh, 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 these from youth moving on forward in terms of there it really hasn't been any stop whatsoever. So that statement in terms of uh, sports reflecting our values, especially you take a look at football and you just hear uh, from so many people, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're not mentally prepared to go without football this upcoming fall. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And your thoughts on that, Mike? That's it's, It is amazing in a lot of ways. Yeah, I, I thought it's thought provoking. Budgets reflect our values. You know, where your heart is is where you spend your money, where you prioritize your dollars. And I think it I think it was quite pointed in the article uh, when when he stated, is it the interest is it in the interest of adults or unbelievably high salaries? Or is it in the interest of student athletes? And in the name of budgets uh, revenue it, it goes back to what CB is saying. You have folks still preparing for for that for the upcoming fall uh, football season. Um, but I think in the I, I think a lot of colleges, universities, budget are going to make some hardcore decisions that and and we're going to see exactly where their values lay. And to top that, when we see these decisions made, I think it's going to either disappoint us. Or please, it's going to be dipolar, if you know what I mean. Once they make these decisions, they're going to cut programs or they're going to make sweeping cuts in salaries or they're going to cut problems in the effort of keeping football in. That, that, those are the only choices they can make. But it depends on where your values and the budget lie and where those decisions uh, start from that point. But I think it's going to be a dipolar decision in, uh, in America. You know, one, one of the questions yeah. that I kind of thought uh, aloud is if you do make this, these decisions now to cut these programs or to cut salaries or whatever, the case, is there a chance that they come back in the future or how long, you know, do we wait before, they, you know, that, that, that golf program comes back or whatever the case might be? But I, I've, you know, just been kind of curious about that. If you make a decision now, is it sort of a, a strategic something that you, you just might not see it again, or uh, is this something that's already been kind of kind of rolling in your head, if you will? The the other question to that is, you know, will some, and I think they pointed it out in an article, are some universities or some athletic programs going to use this as an excuse to cut mm -hmm. programs that were already, so to speak, on the chopping block? And I think we'd be lying to ourselves if we said, no, there aren't any. There are probably going to be a few that were on the chopping jump block and COVID-19 is used as an excuse to get rid of, of West Hell State golf team. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, unfortunately. I, I think you make a great point there. In fact, as you embed in this article as we move forward, and then I'll jump through a part that came ahead of it, but because you jumped there, I think it's important to acknowledge that David Repath a former NCAA compliance director and professor of sport business at Ohio University said he fears schools will use the economic crisis as an excuse to make program cuts. They have already been pondering exactly what you said, Mike, that that's going to come. He adds on to that in here. He also wonders if fewer opportunities for athletes in non-revenue college sports provides a catalyst to sever some of the ties between 
amateur athletics and higher education in the United States. One of the reasons that he brought this up is he actually wrote a book that looks at the alternative models of sports development in America. Uh, Repath makes the case that U.S. Uh, should move towards the European style academy system at least youth athletes develop their games and receive an education but the two are not tethered the way they are in American college sports. Um, it seems like to some degree specifically what you see actually uh, with maybe the new move of the NBA uh, uh, in a lot of ways where they're reserving a space uh, in their G League specifically for uh, high school seniors uh, that would rather play uh, in the NBA and prepare themselves in this, I would say, this academy system style for a year or so and then move on, if possible, to the NBA uh, as part of the draft class coming versus spending that year in college. Uh, do you see that more of this European style move? Do you see the NBA, what they're doing in the G League, part of that? Uh, as well as you see some degree with uh, Major League Soccer, or do you see those as just totally two separate things uh, and not part of what we've seen in college at all? Well, I, I think, number one, I, I think a cottage industry would be, could, uh, would be put on notice uh, in terms of AAU and things of that nature. So I, I'm, I'm not exactly sure how the academy model works here in the States uh, in terms of uh, with that entire uh, uh, movement, if you will, uh, AAU, uh, how would it transfer over to academy? I think you get a lot of blowback on that. Yeah, no, no, good, great point when you talk about transitioning. Will it fit? Can it fit? In terms of it being so dichotomous to what we see going on currently in the U.S. Um, it seems like we're starting to move that way, but how far will it let things move, which we'll get into a, a second part of the discussion yeah. when we dive into a little bit uh, the new information that came out on the NIL component of the NCA, and do you think that they move far enough? But before we move too far out of this, I did want to go back a little bit and talk about a gentleman named A.J. Matisse, the founder of the Sports Analytics Consulting from Navigate Research, and a couple of hundred of sports programs where he – were cut during the last economic downturn after the 2008 financial crisis, as I'm sure you recall. Most programs don't break even, and he expects more cuts this time, too. So it kind of sounds like, sounds like that some of this is in the wash. Other parts of it, it is associated with the fact that um, uh, this is just the dynamics of what's going on economically. So it may be a combination of the two in regards to what people uh, we're looking to do also financially in a lot of ways maybe what they have to do so you kind of have that going back and forth he does this quote and I want you to frame your discussion on this particular quote if you would if donors are unable to set up and endow the programs for at least uh, keep it above where it water there will be a number of programs that will be cut especially if it is sustained economic downturn uh, which seems pretty realistic um, he was saying in this article uh, that we're going through in terms of college co cut sports programs could new athletic departments models emerge go ahead and jump back into this mike before i go to charles yeah so uh the, I, I guess the new athletic departments that emerge are going to look different um i i think it's without question that they will um but what they look like is going to depend on not only the the conference but it's also going to depend on the school system itself and now you're going to ask individual institutions to see where they value it and where those decisions are made and what that new model looks like. If you look at a business model of any organization, corporate organization, it reflects the values, the spending philosophy, um, and the strategic um, plan for that institution. That's Those three factors, that's going to look different for different universities. Um, so it's going to look different. It just depends on what part of the country and then what sports and what framework works best for that institution. Certainly with that, uh, Mike, great points. I want to move over to Charles uh, before we move into our next uh, segment and take a quick break uh, in between to the next article we're going to break down. But, Charles, what are your final thoughts on uh, that framing that we just uh, brought to the table? I mean, Mike makes a great point. I, I think if you look at being a, a donor to a program uh, and if you're going to be part of 
whatever ad's club or whatever the the, the group is I, I guess the the million dollar question is okay what am i putting my money towards am i putting it just just tell me up front am i putting it towards football and basketball or what are we dispersing this out toward the uh other nine revenue sports but uh, if my if my values are geared toward football basketball then i you know i kind of want to know that information up front i kind of want to know what is my x number of dollars what is it going towards so i i think you know that might make some, a point it's going to vary from school to school but it, it's it's just kind of interesting the kind of the mindset of what uh, uh donors can, can will be thinking of going forward this is dr gaville with inside hbc sports lab we'll take this quick break and be right back with you As we start to review this uh, second article, let me uh, get into this break real quick for you. But before we do that, let me make sure I line uh, it up. Oh, uh, here we go. <laughs> here we go. You Ladies and gentlemen, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, you know you got to have it right there. <laughs> the HBCU report, and right now. You're inside the HBCU Sports Lab with my guy, all hail the dean of HBCU Sports. You know I named him that. Dr. Kenyatta Kabil, my guy. What's happening, man? So, so he got to come up with a name for me and Charles. All right, you know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I will I will tell him to check that out and make sure he understands that. Tell, him, uh, tell yeah. him he got he got he got to come up with a, a name for us. <laughs> so you you all guys know by now the NCAA uh, has moved on its stance and the committee that was studying this said that they are going to move forward with uh, um, college athletes having the opportunity to make money off the name, image, and likeness. Um, but did they go far enough? Uh, the NCAA announced Wednesday that one of the its innumerable working uh, groups made recommendations to its board of governors that college athletics should be allowed to make money off their names, image, and likenesses, where certain guardrails and places place to fend off overzealous fans. So they said they're going to do it, but then they put this caveat out there that they're going to have these guardrails. So they're admitting to you they have these guardrails uh, to fend off not necessarily students or anything they're going to do, but these supposedly overzealous um, people. I, I don't know who this overzealous component is, but it's somebody. So I see you having this huge smile Charles so I'm certainly going to let you jump in here and start this off because uh, it looks like you're biting the bits to get something out well I, I'm, I'm, I'm tickled by it because I I, I, I kind of get tickled sometimes by whatever guardrails the NCAA attempts to put in place guardrails smart whales you know um, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I, 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 you know it's like the, the Bart Simpson mean at least you tried you know <laughs> I just I, I don't see how they're not going to defend off uh, overzealous whomevers, you know, in regards to uh, whether they want uh, their brand associated with said athlete. And no doubt about it. Mike, what are your thoughts on this? Where is this going? Is this enough? Uh, are you appeased about this? Do you have some concerns even with them doing this? Or do you think they need to go further that they didn't go far or enough? Um, I think they didn't go far enough in, in, in terms of well, let me first say I think it's the right thing to do uh, in terms of the athletes. Yeah. And I don't I don't know if they went far enough in two aspects. Uh, number one, they put so many filters and guards on it. I don't know how effective it may be. And number two, how much thought has been put into this before putting something into act? You know, they the, I think it's cited, you know, California, Colorado, you know, Colorado bill specifically prohibits colleges and universities from providing uh, prospective athletes with compensation prior to their signing or scholarship offer. So now do you say, okay, if we use their likeliness and they're the top recruit, we can't compensate them until they sign. Now you have to go through and now you have to put all kinds of boundaries. I don't think that much work has taken place yet. And now you're putting this into play. And now you're putting it into play. State, it's going to be a state-by-state state decision. So how do you manage it? 
How do you manage it such that it's successful? Because I think the majority of Americans think it's the right thing to do, but how do you manage it? And I don't know if we've thought this thing through. Uh, by just saying we put guards and filters, there are certain uh, proposals that are, to me, still unfair. If you're going to give them compensation, why say you can't use their number or, or whatever? It, they're making that number famous. So I think there's a lot of questions that need to be answered before I think this is a success. Well, there's a component of this when you start talking about the amateurism where those individuals that do question inside that you talk about, Mike, so I think you're bringing up some ex excellent points. And so I did want to you to further address that. Uh, but first, you have this language of amateurism, which is this also done at the Olympic level for the International Committee. Um, that for long periods of time, they said amateurism, at least coming out of the United States, were pure, basically college and below individuals that were not uh, provided money off that. But the Olympics, which is about this amateurism, has walked off that, if you would. And so now you have professionals that can participate in the Olympics, which is still supposed to be this amateur framework. So. What is so different in your mind from that amateurism model as it was and now as it's moved fa uh, forward with uh, those that participate in the Olympics can make money uh, off of deals, um, like names, the likenesses, and whatsoever, just like the U.S. and each country can get paid the Olympic committees, but their athletes can get uh, at least uh, commercial rights and pay one yeah. so they can do their training and all that kind of stuff but also so they can make a living as they go through this uh, uh, above the average means that anybody else that has a career path. Uh, the second component I'll talk about this that I think follows into some of your concerns and questions I think is interesting is that college athletics is the only space in America where you don't have your own rights or have the ability even college students that are not athletes have the ability if they, and obviously this is one that everybody talks about, if, if they play a musical instrument, if they act, they can go act. If they um, theater, they can go uh, do dances and get paid for those dances. If they are a DJ, <laughs> which has become popular <laughs> during this time, uh, they could go out and DJ. Uh, they could go on Facebook and DJ if they had that talent to DJ for college friends and take cash <laughs> out money. Uh, and, and get it, uh, but literally the only space uh, in the world uh, and in the United States that is supposed to be this beacon for capitalism is the only space where they create this unique nugget that says that college athletes for some reason, and we know the history of why it was, but for some reason it still has to be that way, uh, that something will fundamentally happen as if we don't see that there's different levels in college athletics now with the Power Five, we name them, Next Five, FCS, FBS, uh, the Children of the Corn, Division Two, whatever else you want to name it. Uh, but Mike, what is your framing of why that doesn't resonate with you? Or does it maybe? But, yeah, so for me, you know, to your first point, if you look at Olympic athletes, um, they get the benefit, number one, they get the benefit of at least getting a either direct salary and or endorsements. They get the comp, they get both. Um, and the other thing is the idea of intellectual property. Um, and I'm trying to think of an example. In law, there's this intellectual property where you come up with a concept or an idea or even a saying, you're protected if that idea or, or whatever generates revenue. So you have athletes that come up with poses. You have athletes that come up with uniform styles that the university benefits off of that they can't capitalize off of because of those filters or what those laws are in place, whereas amateur athletes can. The other thing is with the amateur athletes, I think you have more of an employer-employee relationship, whereas you're still muddy with this proposal and what it has with the athletes. They're still, I guess, student-athletes. But, you know, in the eyes of the law, when you create a kind of an employer, employee or contractor relationship, almost, you know, you're paying a, a professional amateur athlete 
who's still in college. I don't think we've parsed that enough yet, and I think that's the difference between a lot of the amateurisms, which a lot of those folks are not getting the benefit of an education. They're not in any formal educational system. It is purely, you know, direct pay. It is purely endorsement. It is purely I'm capitalizing off my ideas, my concepts. If I wear black socks like the five fat, the Fab Five did, you know, folks were capitalizing off that. Do you know how much money the Nike made off black Nike socks because they made them famous? Um, so I think there's a, a, a tremendous difference, and I think the, the the line is so blurred that the, unfortunately we've made a step in not right direction, but a lot of these athletes still will not be able to take advantage to what I think or to the level I think they deserve. Fair point, and I appreciate that we have this discussion so we can get in these viewpoints and yeah. uh, giving our listeners the opportunity of what is going out in the world that everybody isn't thinking in one way. Um, <clears throat> whether you think it's right what or wrong, it's good to hear those perspectives. Go ahead, Charles. What are the list? What are the listeners saying, Doctor Cavill? Um, they're yeah. jumping in here and uh, they're, they're just listening in thus far <clears throat> and they really haven't formed a way back and forth in terms of exactly how they thought about that um, Jimmy jumps in here and says um, how are they going to pay for all the revenue sports uh, in terms yep. of moving forward in terms of this looks like and my answer to that uh, as we uh, jump in there and then I'll let you comment if you would like before we move to this next uh, article to kind of close out uh, the show for the day is the fact um, if you really start looking at it from a pure economic standpoint we've already had the test that says that th particularly those players that play at the power five level um, in terms of what we know what they earn from revenue um, that they are with the scholarship is only one third in the worth average now if you're talking about quarterbacks, it goes up a little bit, and obviously you start going to third streamers, it goes down. But just an average, uh, that the average scholarship limit, and you got to make sure that you're looking at this, whether it's a private school or not, but most of the schools are public. So if you just take an average, you would say that the average player playing at the college level, you know, somebody that's relatively known as a star, uh, would be worth three times that than their scholarship, right? So let's just set that as a baseline. Well, what you if since they're not making money there, that means they're still getting the revenue. So the revenue's there. So the question becomes, like anything, is where does it go? Well, where we find out it is going is these college coaches' salaries, right? They have ballooned right. over the last three years. Many of us are amazed at how much college coaches are making, and some of them are topping off at the bottom part of what you've seen in the NFL. So they're making as much as many of the professional uh, coaches, which is supposed to be the highest level. So that tells you that their salary, to some degree, is off. And that's not because of that the free market is not working for them, but it means the displacement in that market is not there. You also can look at the facilities. These lavish facilities, when we talk about them putting swimming pools and barber shops, those are obviously not things that are natural to the sporting event. You don't really even see those at a lot of level at the professional level. You've seen a lot of college players say that um, they had better things facility-wise than they have at the professional level. So that gives you some indications that they're not necessary, they're more luxury. So again, that means that you're overcompensating because you have this ex extra revenue um, and you don't want to just pile it up because you're a 501C, so you can't keep but so much in the reserves so that means you also have the case that they're returning some of this money to the college, which obviously the college likes in terms of them being able to spend it where they need to on the academic side. But that's where all that money is going. It's going to other people that are bloating what they have, meaning that they have the money to even give back to school when other programs uh, can't even operate on the plus side. That means that they're getting more of the distribution in a lot of ways than this yeah. probably could be more evenly spread across different divisions. They're yep. overpaying coaches, meaning that's revenue that could be going to players, right? They're building lavish facilities that are not necessarily necessary for what they're doing at this level, which means that money could be going to players. So money is there. So it's not necessarily a question, as he said, where would the revenue or where would the money go? The question is, is where do you believe it should be spent? And so at this yeah. point, 
uh, as we go back and forth, essentially what most people are saying is it shouldn't be spent with the athletes. And where people that are on the other side are frustrated with that is this is the only industry that you're able to do that. In fact, anywhere else it's actually illegal. Anywhere else, people would say that's anti-American, that's anti-capitalism if you wouldn't <laughs> yeah. do that anywhere. So it's so odd that you can say it on one side, but anywhere else, people would literally, as we see around here, would protest and march if you try to do something like that. So I do want to make sure we get this in as we have this last 10 minutes of this conversation. One of the last things that come out, and this is the most recent one that came out essentially, is NCA has outlined key principles for restarting college um, athletics. So this is on college sports, which is really fascinating for a lot of people. And I want to see where you kind of uh, landed on this. Um, NCA says the ability to assess immunity on the college campus have been reliable, rapid diagnostic testing available. So it has to be reliable and rapid diagnostic testing. And what's intriguing about that, that's some things that you heard from a national perspective, and you have certain governors that are questioning whether they've been able to do that within their state. Uh, nationally, yeah. have those things been put to them? So uh, I think it's fascinating that they put that out there, which is following the NCA researchers and the scientists there. Um, and so what they did is they put out key principles for restarting college sports according to a document that was released on Friday. So before I go a little further in that, just on that part of it, if you would, Mike, what are your thoughts in terms of this being the assessment for restarting college athletics that you need testing, reliable diagnostic testing, and it has to be reliable? Does that make sense to you? Is that plausible? It makes sense, but I don't know how possible it is um, because you have not only you mentioned governments, but you have organizations, corporations that are struggling with that. And which, you know, do we use antibody testing or do we wait for, you know, some kind of, you know, cure to come out lately? What's a reliable test? I don't know how plausible that is. Uh, uh, the article said something about core principles of resocialization and collegiate sport. And there are other measures that the article outlines, but, you know, plausible testing, I don't think we're there yet. The society, either, even, and from a medical advancement standpoint, I don't think we're there yet. Because you see, even local municipal governments, uh, response agencies are still struggling with that. So what alone lets me think that the colleges and universities will be a step ahead of these agencies and organizations? Great point, and I'm, yeah. Charles, I, I'm a no-brainer, so I'm going to take the next step because I don't want you to be repetitive. So the requirements are released by the NCA and put together by the COVID-19 advisory panel of medical and public health experts, so these are people trained in the field, weave together uh, part of this White House, quote-unquote, open up America again guidelines with how they will apply to a campus in a college sporting setting. So this is both the college setting as well as colleges opening in general is melting this. So part of this key among the nine core principles that you associated, Mike, in terms of need to be pointed out, uh, whereas I want Charles to kind of look at this and respond to this part of it, core principles of resocialization of college sports is that universities should have a plan or plans for temperature checks, testing, isolating and contact tracing and acquiring adequate protective equipment for athletic health care providers. So the same question I put to you as we read deeper in this, uh, does this make sense? And I pretty much know where you're going to go with that part of it. But the second level of that question is, is this realistic for colleges? And if it is, does this realisticness of being able to do these things, does it split between the power five financially maybe more in position to do it versus all the other ones that fall under that. Uh, if you would expand on that, Charles. I, I would say May 5th, 2020, I, I don't see how it's plausible. Uh, I think there is a, a definitive divide um, mm. between whatever the Power Five conferences might do, and and we see now that they, they are <laughs> operating on a completely different uh, 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 time frame, a, a completely different scale than 
uh, as you go down the, the next group of five to the to the FCS to uh, Division Two the NAIA. So you know they might have maybe by July fifth or August fifth the ability to test for uh, uh, to to have plans for temperature checks and testing and isolating and contact tracing, but. I don't know how this works for everybody else to act as the CDC. I, I just, I'm, I'm really confused on uh, how you're going to move forward uh, with a, a, a fall season for everybody else. Uh, I, what Michigan and, and, and Ohio State can do, I'm not exactly sure Grambling and Jackson State can do the exact same thing. And my focus, of course... Uh, with this being inside HBCU Sports Lab, my focus is looking at whether Jackson State Grambling can can move forward in, in terms of how how to go forward here. So I love it. I love it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's what we're discussing. In this is in terms of how does this trickle down in terms of the HBCU perspective of what's going to take place, uh, maybe as early as this fall, particularly this summer. If you're talking about spring uh, summer sports, as you're starting to hear this June first date float out there for some programs. With that, the next part of this is a quote directly from the NCAA Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Brian Hanline. He states, quote, it is also important to take into consideration that there will not be a quick single day of reemergence into society. He quotes, he's also quoted as saying, we will reemerge in a manner that recognizes COVID-19 will be around until there is an effective vaccine, treatment or both. That is why resocialization should be rolled out in a phased way that helps assure sustained low infection spread, as well as aids into the ability to quick diagnosis and isolate new cases. So with this being said, you have conferences within different regions, obviously components of different states throughout the US. And usually when you think about college sports, you have these seasonal uh, components that are associated with the sports uh, across the nation. Now, uh, even if you try to do seasonally, you have something else that is ru- interrupting that in regards to these phase approaches that could be different from state to state. And if you're talking about some states as big as Texas, maybe it's different regions or different cities within a state, right? And so how does it work with conference affiliation that spreads through three or four different states? Most of them are at least um, geographically uh, matched where they go uh, realign from state to state, contiguous. But then you have some of these conferences that skip different states and in different regions. How does it work in your mind in terms of a conference being able to pull us as a conference commissioner saying we're going to try to do this with different <laughs> states within the conference affiliation? Unlike what you see at the professional level where they're all on one page. Uh, what are your thoughts on that, Mike? Um, <laughs> my short answer is no, I don't see it working. Here's why. Here's why. Here's why, and I think you and CB both hit it. You have conferences where you have institutions in different states. Those states are doing different things. The cities where the colleges and universities are are doing different things. You have different, and throw into the factor that you mentioned, different seasonal impacts. So it's almost close to impossible to manage a phase, at least at the collegiate level, reemergence back into uh, the the athletic world into the collegiate world, uh, it's more of a challenge. Again, corporations have the same struggle. Uh, hospitals, municipal organizations, they have the same struggles. But now you're dealing with universities, and even the the conferences such as the Power Five that have the budgets, they still I don't think have the know how or the technology to be able to have an effective phased in approach given yeah. our conditions. Um, you know, you, you take some of the methods, um, the things they're going to have to put in place. You know, you talk about testing. You talk about, you know, social distancing. They're going to have to bring in additional staff even to make that possible because now you have athletic trainers at a risk. Somebody has to test these people. So now you're adding overhead to an already <laughs> crept budget to phase in something with technology we don't have. It's, right. it, I just don't see it being successful right now. No doubt about it. I think we're going to have to leave it right there as we close off. As this is Dr. Cavill's Inside the HBCU Sports Lab with Mike Washington, giving you insight and breaking down a, li- a lot of these articles that are floating around in regards to what are we trying to do uh, in terms of. Uh, 
NCAA, the HBCU sports, uh, dealing with COVID-19 pandemic. Um, many different areas are uh, exploding around yeah. us in terms of how we're going to look at I that. So we hope you enjoy uh, us trying I to break some of these articles down in our perspective of what it means overall to college athletic sports and then what it also means specifically to our HBCU sports. With that, I am Dr. Kenyatta Kabil uh, inside HBCU Sports Lab with Mike Washington and Charles Bishop, uh, brought to you, presented by... THGAgency.com. I am Dr. Kenyatta Caville, the Dean of College of HBCU Sports with Mike Washington and Charles Bishop. As we come to a close, we hope you enjoyed our lecture today in regards to what it looks like moving forward. Again, we want to thank you for listening to Dr. Bill's Inside HBCU Sports Lab radio show with Mike Washington and Charles Bishop every Tuesday right here on 6 to 7 here right here on Case Waste 1230 AM Houston, Texas. Follow me, Dr. Kenyatta Caville on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. Dream big and continue to move forward. We will talk with you soon. Course lecture, Course lecture dismissed. dismissed. Happy Cinco de Mayo. <laughs> Happy Cinco de Mayo. <laughs>